Talk 4 Practical Thought About Practical Thought July 20th, 1996 An Informal Talk In this talk, Charlie explains how he makes decisions and solves problems by taking us step-by-step step through a diverse set of mental models. He presents a case study that asks rhetorically how the listener would go about producing a $2 trillion business from scratch, using Coca-Cola as his example. Naturally, he has his own solution, apt to strike you as both brilliant and perceptive. Charlie's case study leads him to a discussion of academia's failures and its record of having produced generations of sloppy decision-makers. For this problem, he has other solutions. This talk was delivered in 1996 to a group that has a policy of not publicizing its programs. Editor's warning, as suggested by Charlie. Most people don't understand this talk. Charlie says it was an extreme communication failure when made, and people have since found it difficult to understand even when read slowly twice. To Charlie, these outcomes have profound educational implications. The title of my talk is Practical Thought About Practical Thought, with a question mark at the end. In a long career, I have assimilated various ultra-simple general notions that I find helpful in solving problems. Five of these helpful notions I will now describe. After that, I will present to you a problem of extreme scale. Indeed, the problem will involve turning startup capital of $2 million into $2 trillion, a sum large enough to represent a practical achievement. Then I will try to solve the problem, assisted by my helpful general notions. Following that, I will suggest that there are important educational implications in my demonstration. I will so finish because my objective is educational, my game today being a search for better methods of thought. The first helpful notion is that it is usually best to simplify problems by deciding big no-brainer questions first. The second helpful notion mimics Galileo's conclusion that scientific reality is often revealed only by math, as if math was the language of God. Galileo's attitude also works well in messy, practical life. Without numerical fluency in the part of life most of us inhabit, you are like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. The third helpful notion is that it is not enough to think problems through forward. You must also think in reverse, much like the rustic who wanted to know where he was going to die so that he'd never go there. Indeed, many problems can't be solved forward, and that is why the great algebraist Carl Jacobi so often said, invert, always invert, and why the Pythagoreans thought in reverse to prove that the square root of two was an irrational number. The fourth helpful notion is that the best and most practical wisdom is elementary academic wisdom. But there is one extremely important qualification— you must think in a multidisciplinary manner. You must routinely use all the easy-to-learn concepts from the freshman course in every basic subject. Where elementary ideas will serve, your problem-solving must not be limited, as academia and many business bureaucracies are limited, by extreme balkanization into disciplines and subdisciplines, with strong taboos against any venture outside assigned territory. Instead, you must do your multidisciplinary thinking in accord with Ben Franklin's prescription in Poor Richard. If you want it done, go. If not, send. If in your thinking you rely entirely on others, often through purchase of professional advice, whenever outside a small territory of your own, you will suffer much calamity, and it is not just difficulties in complex coordination that will do you in. You will also suffer from the reality evoked by the Shavian character who said, 
In the last analysis, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. Indeed, a Shavian character for once understated the horrors of something George Bernard Shaw didn't like. It is not usually the conscious malfeasance of your narrow professional advisor that does you in. Instead, your troubles come from his subconscious bias. His cognition will often be impaired, for your purposes, by financial incentives different from yours, and he will also suffer from the psychological defect caught by the proverb, To a man with a hammer every problem looks like a nail. The fifth helpful notion is that really big effects, Lollapalooza effects, will often come only from large combinations of factors. For instance, tuberculosis was tamed, at least for a long time, only by routine combined use in each case of three different drugs, and other Lollapalooza effects, like the flight of an airplane, follow a similar pattern. It is now time to present my practical problem, and here is the problem. It is 1884 in Atlanta. You are brought, along with twenty others like you, before a rich and eccentric Atlanta citizen named Glotz. Both you and Glotz share two characteristics. First, you routinely use in problem-solving the five helpful notions, and second, you know all the elementary ideas and all the basic college courses, as taught in 1996. However, all discoverers and all examples demonstrating these elementary ideas come from dates before 1884. Neither you nor Glotz knows anything about anything that has happened after 1884. Glotz offers to invest two million dollars in 1884 dollars, yet take only half the equity, for a Glotz charitable foundation— in a new corporation organized to go into the non-alcoholic beverage business and remain in that business only forever. Glotz wants to use a name that has somehow charmed him, Coca-Cola. The other half of the new corporation's equity will go to the man who most plausibly demonstrates that his business plan will cause Glotz's foundation to be worth a trillion dollars a hundred and fifty years later in the money of that later time, 2034, despite paying out a large part of its earnings each year as a dividend. This will make the whole new corporation worth two trillion dollars, even after paying out many billions of dollars in dividends. You have fifteen minutes to make your pitch. What do you say to Glotz? Here is my solution, my pitch to Glotz, using only the helpful notions and what every bright college sophomore should know. Well, Glotz, the big no-brainer decisions that, to simplify our problem, should be made first are as follows. First, we are never going to create something worth two trillion dollars by selling some generic beverage. Therefore, we must make your name, Coca-Cola, into a strong, legally protected trademark. Second, we can get to two trillion dollars only by starting in Atlanta, then succeeding in the rest of the United States, then rapidly succeeding with our new beverage all over the world. This will require developing a product that has universal appeal because it harnesses powerful elemental forces, and the right place to find such powerful elemental forces is in the subject matter of elementary academic courses. We will next use numerical fluency to ascertain what our target implies. We can guess reasonably that by 2034 there will be about 8 billion beverage consumers in the world. On average, each of these consumers will be much more prosperous in real terms than the average consumer of 1884. Each consumer is composed mostly of water— and must ingest about 64 ounces of water per day. This is eight eight-ounce servings. Thus, if our new beverage and other imitative beverages in our new market can flavor and otherwise improve only 25% of ingested water worldwide, and we can occupy half of the new world market, we can sell 2.92 trillion eight-ounce servings in 2034. 
and if we can then net four cents per serving, we will earn $117 billion. This will be enough if our business is still growing at a good rate to make it easily worth $2 trillion. A big question, of course, is whether four cents per serving is a reasonable profit target for 2034. And the answer is yes, if we can create a beverage with strong universal appeal. 150 years is a long time. The dollar, like the Roman drachma, will almost surely suffer monetary depreciation. Concurrently, real purchasing power of the average beverage consumer in the world will go way up. His proclivity to inexpensively improve his experience while ingesting water will go up considerably faster. Meanwhile, as technology improves, the cost of our simple product in units of constant purchasing power will go down. All four factors will work together in favor of our four cent per serving profit target. Worldwide beverage purchasing power in dollars will probably multiply by a factor of at least 40 over 150 years. Thinking in reverse, this makes our profit per serving target under 1884 conditions a mere one fortieth of four cents or one tenth of a cent per serving. This is an easy to exceed target as we start out if our new product has universal appeal. That decided, we must next solve the problem of invention to create universal appeal. There are two intertwined challenges of large scale. First, over 150 years, we must cause a new beverage market to assimilate about one-fourth of the world's water ingestion. Second, we must so operate that half the new market is ours, while all our competitors combined are left to share the remaining half. These results are Lollapalooza results. Accordingly, we must attack our problem by causing every favorable factor we can think of to work for us. Plainly, only a powerful combination of many factors is likely to cause the Lollapalooza consequences we desire. Fortunately, the solution to these intertwined problems turns out to be fairly easy if one has stayed awake in all the freshman courses. Let us start by exploring the consequences of our simplifying no-brainer decision that we must rely on a strong trademark. This conclusion automatically leads to an understanding of the essence of our business in proper elementary academic terms. We can see from the introductory course in psychology that, in essence, we are going into the business of creating and maintaining conditioned reflexes. The Coca-Cola trade name and trade dress will act as the stimuli, and the purchase and ingestion of our beverage will be the desired responses. And how does one create and maintain conditioned reflexes? Well, the psychology text gives two answers, one by operant conditioning and two by classical conditioning, often called Pavlovian conditioning to honor the great Russian scientist. And since we want a Lollapalooza result, we must use both conditioning techniques and all we can invent to enhance effects from each technique. The operant conditioning part of our problem is easy to solve. We need only 1. Maximize rewards of our beverage's ingestion, and 2. Minimize possibilities that desired reflexes, once created by us, will be extinguished through operant conditioning by proprietors of competing products. For operant conditioning rewards, there are only a few categories we will find practical. 1. Food value in calories or other inputs. 2. Flavor, texture, and aroma acting as stimuli to consumption under neural pre-programming of man through Darwinian natural selection. 3. Stimulus as by sugar or caffeine. 4. Cooling effect when man is too hot or warming effect when man is too cool. Wanting a Lollapalooza result, we will naturally include rewards in all the categories. To start out, it is easy to decide to design our beverage for consumption cold. There is much less opportunity without ingesting a beverage 
to counteract excessive heat compared with excessive cold. Moreover, with excessive heat, much liquid must be consumed, and the reverse is not true. It is also easy to decide to include both sugar and caffeine. After all, tea, coffee, and lemonade are already widely consumed, and it is also clear that we must be fanatic about determining, through trial and error, flavor and other characteristics that will maximize human pleasure while taking in the sugared water and caffeine we will provide. And, to counteract possibilities that desired operant-conditioned reflexes, once created by us, will be extinguished by operant conditioning employing competing products, there is also an obvious answer. We will make it a permanent obsession in our company that our beverage, as fast as practicable, will at all times be available everywhere throughout the world. After all, a competing product, if it is never tried, can't act as a reward creating a conflicting habit. Every spouse knows that. We must next consider the Pavlovian conditioning we must also use. In Pavlovian conditioning, powerful effects come from mere association. The neural system of Pavlov's dog causes it to salivate at the bell it can't eat, and the brain of man yearns for the type of beverage held by the pretty woman he can't have. And so, Glotz, we must use every sort of decent, honorable Pavlovian conditioning we can think of. For as long as we are in business, our beverage and its promotion must be associated in consumer minds with all other things consumers like or admire. Such extensive Pavlovian conditioning will cost a lot of money, particularly for advertising. We will spend big money as far ahead as we can imagine but the money will be effectively spent. As we expand fast in our new beverage market, our competitors will face gross disadvantages of scale in buying advertising to create the Pavlovian conditioning they need. And this outcome, along with other volume creates power effects, should help us gain and hold at least 50% of the new market everywhere. Indeed, provided buyers are scattered, our higher volumes will give us very extreme cost advantages in distribution. Moreover, Pavlovian effects from mere association will help us choose the flavor, texture, and color of our new beverage. Considering Pavlovian effects, we will have wisely chosen the exotic and expensive-sounding name Coca-Cola instead of a pedestrian name like Glotz's sugared, caffeinated water. For similar Pavlovian reasons, it will be wise to have our beverage look pretty much like wine instead of sugared water. So we will artificially color our beverage if it comes out clear. And we will carbonate our water, making our product seem like champagne or some other expensive beverage, while also making its flavor better and imitation harder to arrange for competing products. And because we are going to attach so many expensive psychological effects to our flavor, that flavor should be different from any other standard flavor so that we maximize difficulties for competitors and give no accidental same flavor benefit to any existing product. What else from the psychology textbook can help our new business? Well, there is that powerful monkey-see-monkey-do aspect of human nature that psychologists often call social proof. Social proof, imitative consumption triggered by mere sight of consumption, will not only help induce trial of our beverage, it will also bolster perceived rewards from consumption. We will always take this powerful social proof factor into account as we design advertising and sales promotion, and as we forego present profit to enhance present and future consumption. More than with most other products, increased selling power will come from each increase in sales. We can now see, Glotz, that by combining one much Pavlovian conditioning— two powerful social proof effects, and three a wonderful-tasting, energy-giving, stimulating, and desirably cold beverage 
that causes much operant conditioning, we are going to get sales that speed up for a long time by reason of the huge mixture of factors we have chosen. Therefore, we are going to start something like an autocatalytic reaction in chemistry, precisely the sort of multi-factor-triggered Lollapalooza effect we need. The logistics and the distribution strategy of our business will be simple. There are only two practical ways to sell our beverage. One, as syrup to fountains and restaurants, and two, as a complete carbonated water product in containers. Wanting Lollapalooza results, we will naturally do it both ways. And wanting huge Pavlovian and social proof effects, we will always spend on advertising and sales promotion, per serving, over 40% of the fountain price for syrup needed to make the serving. A few syrup-making plants can serve the world. However, to avoid needless shipping of mere space and water, we will need many bottling plants scattered over the world. We will maximize profits if, like early General Electric with light bulbs, we always set the first sale price, either 1. for fountain syrup, or 2. for any container of our complete product. The best way to arrange this desirable profit-maximizing control is to make any independent bottler we need a subcontractor, not a vendee of syrup, and certainly not a vendee of syrup under a perpetual franchise, specifying a syrup price frozen forever at its starting level. Being unable to get a patent or copyright on our super-important flavor, we will work obsessively to keep our formula secret. We will make a big hoopla over our secrecy, which will enhance Pavlovian effects. Eventually, food chemical engineering will advance so that our flavor can be copied with near exactitude. But by that time, we will be so far ahead with such strong trademarks and complete, always available worldwide distribution that good flavor copying won't bar us from our objective. Moreover, the advances in food chemistry that help competitors will almost surely be accompanied by technological advances that will help us, including refrigeration, better transportation, and, for dieters, the ability to insert a sugar taste without inserting sugar's calories. Also, there will be related beverage opportunities we will seize. This brings us to a final reality check for our business plan. We will once more think in reverse, like Jacoby. What must we avoid because we don't want it? Four answers seem clear. First, we must avoid the protective, cloying, stop-consumption effects of aftertaste that are a standard part of physiology, developed through Darwinian evolution to enhance the replication of man's genes by forcing a generally helpful moderation on the gene carrier. To serve our ends on hot days, a consumer must be able to drink container after container of our product with almost no impediment from aftertaste. We will find a wonderful no-aftertaste flavor by trial and error and will thereby solve this problem. Second, we must avoid ever losing even half of our powerful trademarked name. It will cost us mightily, for instance, if our sloppiness should ever allow the sale of any other kind of cola for instance, a peppy cola. If there is ever a peppy cola, we will be the proprietor of the brand. Third, with so much success coming, we must avoid bad effects from envy, which is given a prominent place in the Ten Commandments, because envy is so much a part of human nature. The best way to avoid envy, as recognized by Aristotle, is to plainly deserve the success we get. We will be fanatic about product quality, quality of product presentation, and reasonableness of prices, considering the harmless pleasure we will provide. Fourth, after our trademarked flavor dominates our new market, we must avoid making any huge and sudden change in our flavor. Even if a new flavor performs better in blind taste tests, changing to that new flavor would be a foolish thing to do. 
This follows because under such conditions, our old flavor will be so entrenched in consumer preference by psychological effects that a big flavor change would do us little good, and it would do immense harm by triggering in consumers the standard deprival superreaction syndrome that makes takeaways so hard to get in any type of negotiation and helps make most gamblers so irrational. Moreover, such a large flavor change would allow a competitor, by copying our old flavor, to take advantage of both, one, the hostile consumer superreaction to deprival, and two, the huge love of our original flavor created by our previous work. Well, that is my solution to my own problem of turning two million dollars into two trillion dollars even after paying out billions of dollars in dividends. I think it would have won with Glotz in 1884 and should convince you more than you expected at the outset. After all, the correct strategies are clear after being related to elementary academic ideas brought into play by the helpful notions. How consistent is my solution with the history of the real Coca-Cola company? Well, as late as 1896, twelve years after the fictional Glotz was to start vigorously with two million dollars in 1884 dollars, the real Coca-Cola company had a net worth under a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and earnings of about zero. And thereafter, the real Coca-Cola company did lose half its trademark and did grant perpetual bottling franchises at fixed syrup prices and some of the bottlers were not very effective and couldn't easily be changed. And the real Coca-Cola company with this system did lose much pricing control that would have improved results had it been retained. Yet even so, the real Coca-Cola company followed so much of the plan given to Glotz that it is now worth about $125 billion, and will have to increase its value at only 8% per year until 2034 to reach a value of $2 trillion. And it can hit an annual physical volume target of 2.92 trillion servings if servings grow until 2034 at only 6% per year, a result consistent with much past experience and leaving plenty of plain water ingestion for Coca-Cola to replace after 2034. So I would guess that the fictional Glotz, starting earlier and stronger and avoiding the worst errors, would have easily hit his $2 trillion target, and he would have done it well before 2034. This brings me at last to the main purpose of my talk. Large educational implications exist if my answer to Glotz's problem is roughly right and if you make one more assumption I believe true, that most Ph.D. educators, even psychology professors and business school deans, would not have given the same simple answer I did. And if I am right in these two ways, this would indicate that our civilization now keeps in place a great many educators who can't satisfactorily explain Coca-Cola, even in retrospect, and even after watching it closely all their lives. This is not a satisfactory state of affairs. Moreover, and this result is even more extreme, the brilliant and effective executives who, surrounded by business school and law school graduates, have run the Coca-Cola company with glorious success in recent years, also did not understand elementary psychology well enough to predict and avoid the new Coke fiasco, which dangerously threatened their company. That people so talented, surrounded by professional advisors from the best universities, should thus demonstrate a huge gap in their education is also not a satisfactory state of affairs. Such extreme ignorance in both the high reaches of academia and the high reaches of business is a Lollapalooza effect of a negative sort, demonstrating grave defects in academia. Because the bad effect is a Lollapalooza, we should expect to find intertwined multiple academic causes. I suspect at least two such causes. First, academic psychology, while it is admirable and useful as a list of ingenious and important experiments, 
lacks intradisciplinary synthesis. In particular, not enough attention is given to Lollapalooza effects coming from combinations of psychological tendencies. This creates a situation reminding one of a rustic teacher who tries to simplify schoolwork by rounding pi to an even three. And it violates Einstein's injunction that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no more simple. In general, psychology is laid out and misunderstood, as electromagnetism would now be misunderstood if physics had produced many brilliant experimenters like Michael Faraday and no grand synthesizer like James Clark Maxwell. Second, there is a truly horrible lack of synthesis blending psychology and other academic subjects, but only an interdisciplinary approach will correctly deal with reality in academia as with the Coca-Cola company. In short, academic psychology departments are immensely more important and useful than other academic departments think. And at the same time, the psychology departments are immensely worse than most of their inhabitants think. It is, of course, normal for self-appraisal to be more positive than external appraisal. Indeed, a problem of this sort may have given you your speaker today. But the size of this psychology department gap is preposterously large. In fact, the gap is so enormous that one very eminent university, Chicago, simply abolished its psychology department, perhaps with an undisclosed hope of later creating a better version. In such a state of affairs, many years ago, and with much that was plainly wrong already present, the new Coke fiasco occurred. Therein, Koch's executives came to the brink of destroying the most valuable trademark in the world. The academically correct reaction to this immense and well-publicized fiasco would have been the sort of reaction Boeing would display if three of its new airplanes crashed in a single week. After all, product integrity is involved in each case, and the plain educational failure was immense. But almost no such responsible Boeing-like reaction has come from academia. Instead, academia, by and large, continues in its balkanized way to tolerate psychology professors who misteach psychology, non-psychology professors who fail to consider psychological effects obviously crucial in their subject matter, and professional schools that carefully preserve psychological ignorance coming in with each entering class and are proud of their inadequacies. Even though this regrettable blindness and lassitude is now the normal academic result, are there exceptions, providing hope that disgraceful shortcomings of the education system will eventually be corrected? Here my answer is a very optimistic yes. For instance, consider the recent behavior of the Economics Department of the University of Chicago. Over the last decade, this department has enjoyed a near monopoly of the Nobel Prizes in economics, largely by getting good predictions out of free market models postulating man's rationality. And what is the reaction of this department after winning so steadily with its rational man approach? Well, it has just invited into a precious slot amid its company of greats a wise and witty Cornell economist, Richard Thaler. And it has done this because Thaler pokes fun at much that is holy at the University of Chicago. Indeed, Thaler believes with me that people are often massively irrational in ways predicted by psychology that must be taken into account in microeconomics. In so behaving, the University of Chicago is imitating Darwin who spent much of his long life thinking in reverse as he tried to disprove his own hardest-won and best-loved ideas. And so long as there are parts of academia that keep alive its best values by thinking in reverse, like Darwin, we can confidently expect that silly educational practices will eventually be replaced by better ones, exactly as Carl Jacobi might have predicted. This will happen because the Darwinian approach, with its habitual objectivity taken on as a sort of hair shirt, is a mighty approach indeed. No less a figure than Einstein said that one of the four causes of his achievement was self-criticism, 
ranking right up there alongside curiosity, concentration, and perseverance. And to further appreciate the power of self-criticism, consider where lies the grave of that very ungifted undergraduate Charles Darwin. It is in Westminster Abbey, right next to the headstone of Isaac Newton, perhaps the most gifted student who ever lived, honored on that headstone in eight Latin words constituting the most eloquent praise in all graveyard print. Hic depositum est, quod mortale fuit Isaci Newtoni. Here lies that which was mortal of Isaac Newton. A civilization that so places a dead Darwin will eventually develop and integrate psychology in a proper and practical fashion that greatly increases skills of all sorts. But all of us who have dollops of power and see the light should help the process along. There is a lot at stake. If in many high places a universal product as successful as Coca-Cola is not properly understood and explained, it can't bode well for our competency in dealing with much else that is important. Of course, those of you with 50% of net worth in Coca-Cola stock, occurring because you tried to invest 10% after thinking like I did in making my pitch to Glotz, can ignore my message about psychology as too elementary for useful transmission to you. But I am not so sure that this reaction is wise for the rest of you. The situation reminds me of the old-time Warner and Swayze ad that was a favorite of mine. The company that needs a new machine tool and hasn't bought it is already paying for it. Talk 4 Revisited In this talk I attempted to demonstrate large, correctable, and important cognitive failures in U.S. academia and business. After all, I argued, one, if academia and business functioned with best practicable results, most denizens would be able to explain the success of the Coca-Cola company through parsimonious use of basic concepts and problem-solving techniques. Yet, two, as the new Coke fiasco and its aftermath indicated, Neither academia nor business had a respectable grasp of the simple realities causing the success of Coca-Cola. As matters worked out, my 1996 talk failed to get through to almost all people hearing it. Then later, between 1996 and 2006, even when the talk's written version was slowly read twice by very intelligent people who admired me, its message likewise failed. In almost all cases, the message did not get through in any constructive way. On the other hand, no one said to me that the talk was wrong. Instead, people were puzzled briefly, then moved on. Thus, my failure as a communicator was even more extreme than the cognitive failure I was trying to explain. Why? The best explanation, I now think, is that I displayed gross folly as an amateur teacher. I attempted too much. I have always avoided all people who want to converse at length about the meaning of meaning. Yet I chose as my title, Practical Thought About Practical Thought. This was a start into tough territory. Then I worked out a long, complex interplay of five generalized, powerful problem-solving tricks with basic ideas from a great many disciplines. I particularly included psychology, about which I wanted to demonstrate that there is much lamentable ignorance, even among highly educated people, some of whom teach psychology. My demonstration naturally relied on correct psychology as part of my would-be demonstration. This was logically sound. But if psychological ignorance is widespread, why would most of my hearers recognize that my version of psychology was correct? Thus, for most hearers, I did the rough equivalent of trying to explain some hard-to-comprehend ideas by simply defining those ideas as equivalent to themselves. And this was not the outer limit of my teaching folly. After I knew that the written version of my talk was hard to understand, I consented to an order of talks in Poor Charlie's Almanac wherein my psychology talk was Talk 11, inserted many pages after Talk 4. 
Instead, I should have recognized that the order of the two talks should be reversed, considering that Talk 4 assumed that readers had already mastered basic psychology, the subject of Talk 11. Then, finally, I preferred to maintain the original unhelpful order of the two talks. I did this because I like closing the book with my most recent organization of psychology into a sort of checklist that has long been helpful to me. Readers, if they wish, can correct somewhat for the teaching defects that I have stubbornly retained. That is, they can reread Talk 4 after mastering the final talk. If they are willing to endure this ordeal, I predict that at least some of them will find the result worth the effort. Talk 5 The Need for More Multidisciplinary Skills from Professionals Educational Implications April 24, 1998 50th Reunion of Harvard Law School, Class of 1948 Having ranted in the previous speech about all that is wrong in academia, Charlie holds forth here on the solutions. Delivered in 1998 at the 50th reunion of his Harvard Law School class, this talk focuses on a hugely complicated issue, the narrowness of elite education, and segments it into elements whose solutions, when taken together, form a satisfactory answer to the problem. Through a series of rhetorical questions, Charlie posits that professionals, such as attorneys, to their own detriment, lack multidisciplinary skills. From his own extensive multidisciplinary studies, he recognizes that there are subconscious mental tendencies that keep people from broadening their own horizons sufficiently. Nonetheless, he brings unique and memorable solutions to the problem. This talk, a favorite of your editor, clearly demonstrates Charlie's uncommon common sense. He says, When it really matters, as with pilots and surgeons, educational systems employ highly effective structures. Yet they don't employ these same well-understood structures in other areas of learning that are also important. If superior structures are known and available, why don't educators more broadly utilize them? What could be more simple? Today I am going to engage in a game reminding us of our old professors, Socratic Solitaire. I will ask and briefly answer five questions. 1. Do broad-scale professionals need more multidisciplinary skill? 2. Was our education sufficiently multidisciplinary? 3. In elite, broad-scale soft science, what is the essential nature of practicable, best-form, multidisciplinary education? 4. In the last 50 years, how far has elite academia progressed toward attainable, best-form, multidisciplinarity? 5. What educational practices would make progress faster? We start with the question, do broad-scale professionals need more multidisciplinary skill? To answer the first question, we must first decide whether more multidisciplinarity will improve professional cognition. And to decide what will cure bad cognition, it will help to know what causes it. One of Bernard Shaw's characters explained professional defects as follows. In the last analysis, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. There is a lot of truth in Shaw's diagnosis, as was early demonstrated when, in the 16th century, the dominant profession, the clergy, burned William Tyndall at the stake for translating the Bible into English. But Shaw plainly understates the problem in implying that a conscious, self-interested malevolence is the main culprit. More important, there are frequent terrible effects in professionals from intertwined subconscious mental tendencies, two of which are exceptionally prone to cause trouble. One, incentive-caused bias, a natural cognitive drift toward the conclusion that what is good for the professional is good for the client and the wider civilization. And two, 
man with a hammer tendency, with the name taken from the proverb, to a man with only a hammer, every problem tends to look pretty much like a nail. One partial cure for man with a hammer tendency is obvious. If a man has a vast set of skills over multiple disciplines, he, by definition, carries multiple tools, and therefore will limit bad cognitive effects from man with a hammer tendency. Moreover, when he is multidisciplinary enough to absorb from practical psychology the idea that all his life he must fight bad effects from both the tendencies I mentioned, both within himself and from others, he has taken a constructive step on the road to worldly wisdom. If A is narrow professional doctrine and B consists of the big extra useful concepts from other disciplines, then clearly the professional possessing A plus B will usually be better off than the poor possessor of A alone. How could it be otherwise? And thus the only rational excuse for not acquiring more B is that it is not practical to do so, given the man's need for A and the other urgent demands in his life. I will later try to demonstrate that this excuse for unidisciplinarity, at least for our most gifted people, is usually unsound. My second question is so easy to answer that I won't give it much time. Our education was far too unidisciplinary. Broad-scale problems, by definition, cross many academic disciplines. Accordingly, using an undisciplinary attack on such problems is like playing a bridge hand by counting trumps while ignoring all else. This is bonkers, sort of like the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. But nonetheless, too much that is similar remains present in professional practice, and even worse, has long been encouraged in isolated departments of soft science, defined as everything less fundamental than biology. Even in our youth, some of the best professors were horrified by bad effects from the balkanization of academia into insular, turf-protecting enclaves, wherein notions were maintained by leaps of faith plus exclusion of non-believers. Alfred North Whitehead, for one, long ago sounded an alarm in strong language when he spoke of the fatal unconnectedness of academic disciplines. And since then, elite educational institutions, agreeing more and more with Whitehead, have steadily fought unconnectedness by bringing in more multidisciplinarity, causing some awesome plaudits to be won in our time by great unconnectedness fighters at the borders of academic disciplines, for instance, Harvard's E.O. Wilson and Caltech's Linus Pauling. Modern academia now gives more multidisciplinarity than we received and is plainly right to do so. The natural third question then becomes, what is now the goal? What is the essential nature of best form multidisciplinarity in elite education? This question, too, is easy to answer. All we have to do is examine our most successful narrow-scale education, identify essential elements, and scale up those elements to reach the sensible solution. To find the best educational narrow-scale model, we have to look not at unthreatened schools of education and the like, too much driven by our two counterproductive psychological tendencies and other bad influences, but instead look where incentives for effective education are strongest and results are most closely measured. This leads us to a logical place, the hugely successful education now mandatory for pilots. Yes, I am suggesting today that mighty Harvard would do better if it thought more about pilot training. In piloting, as in other professions, one great hazard is a bad effect from man with a hammer tendency. We don't want a pilot ever to respond to a hazard as if it was hazard X just because his mind contains only a hazard X model. And so, for that and other reasons, we train a pilot in a strict six-element system. 1. His formal education is wide enough to cover practically everything useful in piloting. 2. 
His knowledge of practically everything needed by pilots is not taught just well enough to enable him to pass one test or two. Instead, all his knowledge is raised to practice-based fluency, even in handling two or three intertwined hazards at once. Three, like any good algebraist, he is made to think sometimes in a forward fashion and sometimes in reverse. And so he learns when to concentrate mostly on what he wants to happen, and also when to concentrate mostly on avoiding what he does not want to happen. 4. His training time is allocated among subjects so as to minimize damage from his later malfunctions, and so what is most important in his performance gets the most training coverage and is raised to the highest fluency levels. 5. Checklist routines are always mandatory for him. 6. Even after original training, he is forced into a special knowledge maintenance routine, regular use of the aircraft simulator to prevent atrophy through long disuse of skills needed to cope with rare and important problems. The need for this clearly correct six-element system, with its large demands in a narrow-scale field where stakes are high, is rooted in the deep structure of the human mind. Therefore, we must expect that the education we need for broad-scale problem-solving will keep all these elements, but with awesomely expanded coverage for each element. How could it be otherwise? Thus it follows, as the night the day, that in our most elite broad-scale education, wherein we are trying to make silk purses out of silk, we need for best results to have multidisciplinary coverage of immense amplitude, with all needed skills raised to an ever-maintained practice-based fluency, including considerable power of synthesis at boundaries between disciplines, with the highest fluency levels being achieved where they are most needed, with forward and reverse thinking techniques being employed in a manner reminding one of inversion in algebra, and with checklist routines being a permanent part of the knowledge system. There can be no other way, no easier way, to broad-scale worldly wisdom. Thus the task, when first identified in its immense breadth, seems daunting, verging on impossible. But the task, considered in full context, is far from impossible when we consider three factors. First, the concept of all-needed skills lets us recognize that we don't have to raise everyone's skill in celestial mechanics to that of Pierre-Simon Laplace, and also ask everyone to achieve a similar skill level in all other knowledge. Instead, it turns out that the truly big ideas in each discipline, learned only in essence, carry most of the freight. And they are not so numerous, nor are their interactions so complex, that a large and multidisciplinary understanding is impossible for many, given large amounts of talent and time. Second, in elite education, we have available the large amounts of talent and time that we need, after all, we are educating the top 1% in aptitude, using teachers who, on average, have more aptitude than the students. And we have roughly 13 long years in which to turn our most promising 12-year-olds into starting professionals. Third, thinking by inversion and thorough use of checklists is easily learned, in broad-scale life as in piloting. Moreover, we can believe in the attainability of broad multidisciplinary skill for the same reason the fellow from Arkansas gave for his belief in baptism. I've seen it done. We all know of individuals, modern Ben Franklins, who have, one, achieved a massive multidisciplinary synthesis with less time in formal education than is now available to our numerous brilliant young, and two, thus become better performers in their own disciplines, not worse, despite diversion of learning time to matter outside the normal coverage of their own disciplines. Given the time and talent available and examples of successful masters of multiple disciplines, 
What is shown by our present failure to minimize bad effects from man with a hammer tendency is only that you can't win big in multidisciplinarity in soft science academia if you are so satisfied with the status quo or so frightened by the difficulties of change that you don't try hard enough to win big. Which brings us to our fourth question. Judged with reference to an optimized, feasible, multidisciplinary goal, how much has elite soft science education been corrected after we left? The answer is that many things have been tried as corrections in the direction of better multidisciplinarity, and after allowing for some counterproductive results, there has been some considerable improvement, net. But much desirable correction is still undone and lies far ahead. For instance, soft science academia has increasingly found it helpful when professors from different disciplines collaborate or when a professor has been credentialed in more than one discipline. But a different sort of correction has usually worked best, namely augmentation or a take-what-you-wish practice that encourages any discipline to simply assimilate whatever it chooses from other disciplines. Perhaps it has worked best because it bypassed academic squabbles rooted in the tradition and territoriality that had caused the unidisciplinary folly for which correction was now sought. In any event, through increased use of take-what-you-wish, many soft science disciplines reduced folly from man with a hammer tendency. For instance, led by our classmate Roger Fisher, the law schools brought in negotiation, drawing on other disciplines. Over three million copies of Roger's wise and ethical negotiation book have now been sold, and his life's achievement may well be the best ever from our whole class. The law schools also brought in a lot of sound and useful economics, even some good game theory to enlighten antitrust law by better explaining how competition really works. Economics, in turn, took in from a biologist the tragedy of the commons model, thus correctly finding a wicked invisible foot in coexistence with Adam Smith's angelic invisible hand. These days there is even some behavioral economics wisely seeking aid from psychology. However, an extremely permissive practice like Take What You Wish was not destined to have 100% admirable results in soft science. Indeed, in some of its worst outcomes, it helped changes like the assimilation of Freudianism in some literature departments the importation into many places of extremist political ideologies of the left or right that had for their possessors made regaining objectivity almost as unlikely as regaining virginity, and the importation into many law and business schools of hard-form efficient market theory by misguided would-be experts in corporate finance one of whom kept explaining Berkshire Hathaway's investing success by adding standard deviations of luck until, at six standard deviations, he encountered enough derision to force a change in explanation. Moreover, even when it avoided such lunacies, take what you wish had some serious defects. For instance, takings from more fundamental disciplines were often done without attribution, sometimes under new names, with little attention given to rank and a fundamentalness order for absorbed concepts. Such practices, one, act like a lousy filing system that must impair the successful use and synthesis of absorbed knowledge, and two, do not maximize in soft science the equivalent of Linus Pauling's systematic mining of physics to improve chemistry. There must be a better way. This brings us finally to our last question. In elite soft science, what practices would hasten our progress toward optimized disciplinarity? Here again, there are some easy answers. First, many more courses should be mandatory, not optional. And this in turn requires that the people who decide what is mandatory must possess large, multidisciplinary knowledge maintained in fluency. 
This conclusion is as obvious in the training of the would-be broad-scale problem solver as it is in the training of the would-be pilot. For instance, both psychology mastery and accounting mastery should be required as outcomes in legal education. Yet in many elite places, even today, there are no such requirements. Often, such is the narrowness of mind of the program designers that they neither see what is needed and missing, nor are able to fix deficiencies. Second, there should be much more problem-solving practice that crosses several disciplines, including practice that mimics the function of the aircraft simulator in preventing loss of skills through disuse. Let me give an example roughly remembered of this sort of teaching by a very wise but untypical Harvard Business School professor many decades ago. This professor gave a test involving two unworldly old ladies who had just inherited a New England shoe factory making branded shoes and beset with serious business problems described in great detail. The professor then gave the students ample time to answer with written advice to the old ladies. In response to the answers, the professor gave every student an undesirable grade, except for one student who was graded at the top by a wide margin. What was the winning answer? It was very short and roughly as follows. This business field and this particular business in its particular location present crucial problems that are so difficult that unworldly old ladies cannot wisely try to solve them through hired help. Given the difficulties and unavoidable agency costs, the old ladies should promptly sell the shoe factory, probably to the competitor who would enjoy the greatest marginal utility advantage. Thus the winning answer relied not on what the students had most recently been taught in business school, but instead on more fundamental concepts like agency costs and marginal utility lifted from undergraduate psychology and economics. Ah, my fellow members of the Harvard Law Class of 1948, if only we had been much more often tested like that, just think of what more we might have accomplished. Incidentally, many elite private schools now wisely use such multidisciplinary methods in seventh-grade science, while at the same time many graduate schools have not yet seen the same light. This is one more sad example of Whitehead's fatal unconnectedness in education. Third, most soft science professional schools should increase their use of the best business periodicals, like the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, etc. Such periodicals are now quite good and perform the function of the aircraft simulator, if used to prompt practice in relating events to multidisciplinary causes, often intertwined. And sometimes the periodicals even introduce new models for causes instead of merely refreshing old knowledge. Also, it is not just slightly sound to have the student practice in school what he must practice lifelong after formal education is over, if he is going to maximize his good judgment. I know no person in business respected for verified good judgment whose wisdom maintenance system does not include use of such periodicals. Why should academia be different? Fourth, in filling scarce academic vacancies, professors of super-strong, passionate political ideology, whether on the left or right, should usually be avoided. So also for students. Best form multidisciplinarity requires an objectivity such passionate people have lost, and a difficult synthesis is not likely to be achieved by minds in ideological fetters. In our day, some Harvard Law professors could and did point to a wonderful example of just such ideology-based folly. This, of course, was the law school at Yale, which was then viewed by many at Harvard as trying to improve legal education by importing a particular political ideology as a dominant factor. Fifth, soft science should more intensely imitate the fundamental organizing ethos of hard science defined as the fundamental four-discipline combination of math, physics, chemistry, and engineering. This ethos deserves more imitation. 
After all, hard science has, by a wide margin, the best record for both, one, avoiding unidisciplinary folly, and two, making user-friendly a big patch of multidisciplinary domain with frequent good results like those of physicist Richard Feynman, when he so quickly found in cold O-rings the cause of our greatest space shuttle disaster. Previous extensions of the ethos into softer fare have worked well. For instance, biology, starting 150 years ago with a descriptive mess not much related to deep theory, has gradually absorbed the fundamental organizing ethos with marvelous results, as new generations have come to use better thinking methods containing models that answer the question, why? And there is no clear reason why the ethos of hard science can't also help in disciplines far less fundamental than biology. Here, as I interpret it, is this fundamental organizing ethos I am talking about. One, you must both rank and use disciplines in order of fundamentalness. Two, you must, like it or not, master to tested fluency and routinely use the truly essential parts of all four constituents of the fundamental four-discipline combination, with particularly intense attention given to disciplines more fundamental than your own. 3. You may never practice either cross-disciplinary absorption without attribution or departure from a principle of economy that forbids explaining in any other way anything readily explainable from more fundamental material in your own or any other discipline. 4. But when the step three approach doesn't produce much new and useful insight, you should hypothesize and test to establishment new principles, ordinarily by using methods similar to those that created successful old principles. But you may not use any new principle inconsistent with an old one, unless you can now prove that the old principle is not true. You will note that compared with much current practice in soft science, the fundamental organizing ethos of hard science is more severe. This reminds one of pilot training, and this outcome is not a coincidence. Reality is talking to anyone who will listen. Like pilot training, the ethos of hard science does not say, take what you wish, but learn it all to fluency, like it or not. And rational organization of multidisciplinary knowledge is forced by making mandatory, one, full attribution for cross-disciplinary takings, and two, mandatory preference for the most fundamental explanation. This simple idea may appear too obvious to be useful, but there is an old two-part rule that often works wonders in business, science, and elsewhere. One, take a simple basic idea, and two, take it very seriously. And as some evidence for the value of taking very seriously the fundamental organizing ethos, I offer the example of my own life. I came to Harvard Law School very poorly educated, with desultory work habits and no college degree. I was admitted over the objection of Warren Abner Seavey through the intervention of family friend Roscoe Pound. I had taken one silly course in biology in high school, briefly learning, mostly by rote, an obviously incomplete theory of evolution, portions of the anatomy of the paramecium and frog, plus a ridiculous concept of protoplasm that has since disappeared. To this day, I have never taken any course anywhere in chemistry, economics, psychology, or business. But I early took elementary physics and math and paid enough attention to somehow assimilate the fundamental organizing ethos of hard science, which I thereafter pushed further and further into softer and softer fare as my organizing guide and filing system in a search for whatever multidisciplinary worldly wisdom it would be easy to get. Thus my life became a sort of accidental educational experiment with respect to the feasibility and utility of a very gross academic extension of the fundamental organizing ethos by a man who also learned well what his own discipline had to teach. What I found in my extended attempts to complete by informal means my stunted education 
was that plugging along with only ordinary will but with the fundamental organizing ethos as my guide, my ability to serve everything I loved was enhanced far beyond my deserts. Large gains came in places that seemed unlikely as I started out, sometimes making me like the only one without a blindfold in a high-stakes game of pin the tail on the donkey. For instance, I was productively led into psychology, where I had no plans to go, creating large advantages that deserve a story on another day. Today I have no more story. I have finished my talk by answering my own questions as best I could in a brief time. What is most interesting to me in my answers is that, while everything I have said is non-original and has long been obvious to the point of banality to many sound and well-educated minds, all the evils I decry remain grossly over-present in the best of our soft science educational domains, wherein virtually every professor has a too unidisciplinary habit of mind, even while a better model exists just across the aisle in his own university. To me, this ridiculous outcome implies that the soft science departments tolerate perverse incentives. Wrong incentives are a major cause because, as Dr. Samuel Johnson so wisely observed, truth is hard to assimilate in any mind when opposed by interest. And if institutional incentives cause the problem, then a remedy is feasible because incentives can be changed. I have tried to demonstrate today, and indeed by the example of my life, that it is neither inevitable nor advantageous for soft science educational domains to tolerate as much unidisciplinary wrong-headedness as they now do. Please remember the word Dr. Johnson used to describe maintenance of academic ignorance that is removable through diligence. To Dr. Johnson, such conduct was treachery. And if duty will not move improvement, advantage is also available. There will be immense worldly rewards for law schools and other academic domains as for Charlie Munger in a more multidisciplinary approach to many problems, common or uncommon. And more fun as well as more accomplishment. The happier mental realm I recommend is one from which no one willingly returns. A return would be like cutting off one's hands. Talk 5 Revisited As I review Talk 5 in 2006, I would not change a word, and I continue to believe that my ideas are important. In my attitude, I may be displaying too much similarity to my long-dead relative, Reverend Theodore Munger, former chaplain of Yale. Theodore published a collection of his sermons, laying out proper conduct with a strong ex-cathedra tone. Then, Late in life, he published a final edition, reporting in his foreword that he had made no changes at all and was now producing the new edition only because the extreme popularity of his sermons had caused excessive wear in the original printing plates. Talk 6 Investment Practices of Leading Charitable Foundations October 14, 1998 Speech to the Foundation Financial Officers Group at Miramar Sheraton Hotel, Santa Monica, California Sponsored by the Conrad Hilton Foundation, the Amateur Athletic Foundation, the J. Paul Getty Trust, and Rio Hondo Memorial Foundation This speech, delivered in October 1998 to the Foundation Financial Officers Group in Santa Monica, helps account for Charlie's line, It's sad but true, not everybody loves me. In the talk, he attacks the accepted and practiced orthodoxy of his audience with sharp humor, though always without malice. Charlie has a deep and abiding belief in philanthropy, as is demonstrated by his own generous giving, and he seeks here to save the philanthropic community from itself. Charlie believes foundations should serve as societal exemplars, which means they must discourage wasteful, non-productive practices. He posits a choice for his audience, 
the model of genius statesman Ben Franklin or that of disgraced fund manager Bernie Kornfeld. Referring to his days as a limited partnership manager, Charlie employs, as is typical, self-deprecation and self-reflection. Early Charlie Munger is a horrible career model for the young. If Charlie can emerge from that state successfully, he seems to be saying, so can the wayward foundation managers in his audience. I am speaking here today because my friend John Argue asked me, and John well knew that I, who, unlike many other speakers on your agenda, have nothing to sell any of you, would be irreverent about much current investment practice in large institutions, including charitable foundations. Therefore, any hostility my talk will cause should be directed at John Argue, who comes from the legal profession and may even enjoy it. It was long the norm at large charitable foundations to invest mostly in unleveraged marketable domestic securities, mostly equities. The equities were selected by one or a very few investment counseling organizations. But in recent years there has been a drift toward more complexity. Some foundations, following the lead of institutions like Yale, have tried to become much better versions of Bernie Kornfeld's Fund of Funds. This is an amazing development. Few would have predicted that long after Kornfeld's fall into disgrace, major universities would be leading foundations into Kornfeld's system. Now, in some foundations, there are not few but many investment counselors, chosen by an additional layer of consultants who are hired to decide which investment counselors are best, help in allocating funds to various categories, make sure that foreign securities are not neglected in favor of domestic securities, check the validity of claimed investment records, ensure that claimed investment styles are scrupulously followed, and help augment an already large diversification in a way that conforms to the latest notions of corporate finance professors about volatility and beta. But even with this amazingly active, would-be polymathic new layer of consultants choosing consultants, the individual investment counselors in picking common stocks still rely to a considerable extent on a third layer of consultants. The third layer consists of the security analysts employed by investment banks. These security analysts receive enormous salaries, sometimes set in seven figures after bidding wars. The hiring investment banks recoup these salaries from two sources. One, commissions and trading spreads borne by security buyers, some of which are rebated as soft dollars to money managers. Plus, two, investment banking charges paid by corporations that appreciate the enthusiastic way their securities are being recommended by the security analysts. There is one thing sure about all this complexity, including its touches of behavior lacking the full punctilio of honor. Even when nothing but unleveraged stock picking is involved, the total cost of all the investment management plus the frictional costs of fairly often getting in and out of many large investment positions, can easily reach 3% of foundation net worth per annum if foundations urged on by consultants add new activity year after year. This full cost doesn't show up in conventional accounting, but that is because accounting has limitations and not because the full cost isn't present. Next, we come to time for a little arithmetic. It is one thing each year to pay the croupiers 3% of starting wealth when the average foundation is enjoying a real return, say, of 17% before the croupiers take. But it is not written in the stars that foundations will always gain 17% gross, a common result in recent years. And if the average annual gross real return from indexed investment in equities goes back, say, to 5% over some long future period, 
and the croupier's take turns out to remain the waste it has always been, even for the average intelligent player, then the average intelligent foundation will be in a prolonged, uncomfortable shrinking mode. After all, 5% minus 3% minus 5% in donations leaves an annual shrinkage of 3%. All the equity investors in total will surely bear a performance disadvantage per annum equal to the total croupier's costs they have jointly elected to bear. This is an inescapable fact of life, and it is also inescapable that exactly half of the investors— will get a result below the median result after the croupier's take, which median result may well be somewhere between unexciting and lousy. Human nature being what it is, most people assume away worries like those I raise. After all, centuries before Christ, Demosthenes noted, What a man wishes, he will believe. And in self-appraisals of prospects and talents, it is the norm, as Demosthenes predicted, for people to be ridiculously over-optimistic. For instance, a careful survey in Sweden showed that 90% of automobile drivers considered themselves above average. And people who are successfully selling something, as investment counselors do, make Swedish drivers sound like depressives. Virtually every investment expert's public assessment is that he is above average, no matter what the evidence to the contrary. But you may think my foundation at least will be above average. It is well endowed, hires the best, and considers all investment issues at length and with objective professionalism. And to this I respond that an excess of what seems like professionalism will often hurt you horribly precisely because the careful procedures themselves often lead to overconfidence in their outcome. General Motors recently made just such a mistake, and it was a lollapalooza. Using fancy consumer surveys, its excess of professionalism, it concluded not to put a fourth door in a truck designed to serve as the equivalent of a comfortable five-passenger car. Its competitors, more basic, had actually seen five people enter and exit cars. Moreover, they had noticed that people were used to four doors in a comfortable five-passenger car, and that biological creatures ordinarily prefer effort minimization in routine activities and don't like removals of long-enjoyed benefits. There are only two words that come instantly to mind in reviewing General Motors' horrible decision, which has blown many hundreds of millions of dollars, and one of those words is oops. Similarly, the hedge fund, known as Long-Term Capital Management, recently collapsed through overconfidence in its highly leveraged methods, despite IQs of its principles that must have averaged 160. Smart, hard-working people aren't exempted from professional disasters from overconfidence. Often they just go aground in the more difficult voyages they choose, relying on their self-appraisals that they have superior talents and methods. It is, of course, irritating that extra care and thinking is not all good, but also introduces extra error. But most good things have undesired side effects, and thinking is no exception. The best defense is that of the best physicists, who systematically criticize themselves to an extreme degree, using a mindset described by Nobel laureate Richard Feynman as follows. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. But suppose that an abnormally realistic foundation, thinking like Feynman, fears a poor future investment outcome because it is unwilling to assume that its unleveraged equities will outperform equity indexes, minus all investment costs, merely because the foundation has adopted the approach of becoming a fund of funds with much investment turnover and layers of consultants who consider themselves above average. What are this fearful foundation's options as it seeks improved prospects? 
There are at least three modern choices. One, the Foundation can both dispense with its consultants and reduce its investment turnover as it changes to indexed investment in equities. Two, the Foundation can follow the example of Berkshire Hathaway and thus get total annual croupier costs below one-tenth of one percent of principal per annum by investing with virtually total passivity in a very few much-admired domestic corporations. And there is no reason why some outside advice can't be used in this process. All the fee-payer has to do is suitably control the high talent in investment counseling organizations so that the servant becomes the useful tool of its master. Instead of serving itself under the perverse incentives of a sort of Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Three, the Foundation can supplement unleveraged investment in marketable equities with investment in limited partnerships that do some combination of the following unleveraged investment in high tech corporations in their infancy, leveraged investments in corporate buyouts leveraged relative value trades in equities, and leveraged convergence trades and other exotic trades in all kinds of securities and derivatives. For the obvious reasons given by purveyors of indexed equities, I think choice one, indexing, is a wiser choice for the average foundation than what it is now doing in unleveraged equity investment and particularly so as its present total croupier costs exceed 1% of principal per annum. Indexing can't work well forever if almost everybody turns to it, but it will work all right for a long time. Choice three, investment in fancy limited partnerships, is largely beyond the scope of this talk. I will only say that the Munger Foundation does not so invest and briefly mention two considerations bearing on LBO funds. The first consideration bearing on LBO funds is that buying 100% of corporations with much financial leverage and two layers of promotional carry, one for the management and one for the general partners in the LBO fund, is no sure thing to outperform equity indexes in the future if equity indexes perform poorly in the future. In substance, an LBO fund is a better way of buying equivalents of marketable equities on margin, and the debt could prove disastrous if future marketable equity performance is bad, and particularly so if the bad performance comes from generally bad business conditions. The second consideration is increasing competition for LBO candidates. For instance, if the LBO candidates are good service corporations, General Electric can now buy more than $10 billion worth per year in GE's credit corporation, with 100% debt financing at an interest rate only slightly higher than the U.S. government is paying. This sort of thing is not ordinary competition, but super competition and there are now very many LBO funds, both large and small, mostly awash in money and with general partners highly incentivized to buy something. In addition, there is increased buying competition from corporations other than GE using some combination of debt and equity. In short, in the LBO field, there is a buried covariance with marketable equities, toward disaster in generally bad business conditions, and competition is now extreme. Given time limitations, I can say no more about limited partnerships, one of which I once ran. This leaves, for extensive discussion, only foundation choice two, more imitation of the investment practices of Berkshire Hathaway in maintaining marketable equity portfolios with virtually zero turnover, and with only a very few stocks chosen. This brings us to the question of how much investment diversification is desirable at foundations. I have more than skepticism regarding the orthodox view that huge diversification is a must for those wise enough, so that indexation is not the logical mode for equity investment. I think the orthodox view is grossly mistaken. 
In the United States, a person or institution with almost all wealth invested long-term in just three fine domestic corporations is securely rich. And why should such an owner care if, at any time, most other investors are faring somewhat better or worse? particularly when he rationally believes, like Berkshire, that his long-term results will be superior by reason of his lower costs, required emphasis on long-term effects, and concentration in his most preferred choices. I go even further. I think it can be a rational choice in some situations for a family or a foundation to remain 90% concentrated in one equity. Indeed, I hope the Mungers follow roughly this course, and I note that the Robert Woodruff Foundations have, so far, proven extremely wise to retain an approximately 90% concentration in the Founders' Coca-Cola stock. It would be interesting to calculate just how all American foundations would have fared if they had never sold a share of Founders' stock. Very many, I think, would now be much better off. But, you may say, the diversifiers simply took out insurance against a catastrophe that didn't occur. And I reply, there are worse things than some foundations losing relative clout in the world, and rich institutions like rich individuals should do a lot of self-insurance if they want to maximize long-term results. Furthermore, all the good in the world is not done by foundation donations. Much more good is done through the ordinary business operations of the corporations in which the foundations invest. And some corporations do much more good than others do in a way that gives investors therein better-than-average long-term prospects. And I don't consider it foolish, stupid, evil, or illegal for a foundation to greatly concentrate investment in what it admires or even loves. Indeed, Ben Franklin required just such an investment practice for the charitable endowment created by his will. One other aspect of Berkshire's equity investment practice deserves comparative mention. So far, there has been almost no direct foreign investment at Berkshire and much foreign investment at foundations. Regarding this divergent history, I wish to say that I agree with Peter Drucker that the culture and legal systems of the United States are especially favorable to shareholder interests compared to other interests and compared to most other countries. Indeed, there are many other countries where any good going to public shareholders has a very low priority, and almost every other constituency stands higher in line. This factor, I think, is underweighed at many investment institutions, probably because it does not easily lead to quantitative thinking using modern financial technique. But some important factor doesn't lose share of force just because some expert can better measure other types of force. Generally, I tend to prefer over direct foreign investment, Berkshire's practice of participating in foreign economies through the likes of Coca-Cola and Gillette. To conclude, I will make one controversial prediction and one controversial argument. The controversial prediction is that if some of you make your investment style more like Berkshire Hathaway's in a long-term retrospect, you will be unlikely to have cause for regret, even if you can't get Warren Buffett to work for nothing. Instead, Berkshire will have cause for regret as it faces more intelligent investment competition. But Berkshire won't actually regret any disadvantage from your enlightenment. We only want what success we can get, despite encouraging others to share our general views about reality. My controversial argument is an additional consideration weighing against the complex, high-cost investment modalities becoming ever more popular at foundations. Even if, contrary to my suspicions, such modalities should turn out to work pretty well, most of the money-making activity would contain profoundly antisocial effects. This would be so because the activity would exacerbate the current harmful trend in which ever more of the nation's ethical young brain power is attracted into lucrative money management 
and its attendant modern frictions, as distinguished from work providing much more value to others. Money management does not create the right examples. Early Charlie Munger is a horrible career model for the young, because not enough was delivered to civilization in return for what was wrested from capitalism. And other similar career models are even worse. Rather than encourage such models, a more constructive choice at foundations is long-term investment concentration in a few domestic corporations that are wisely admired. Why not thus imitate Ben Franklin? After all, old Ben was very effective in doing public good, and he was a pretty good investor, too. Better his model, I think, than Bernie Kornfeld's. The choice is plainly yours to make. Talk 6 Revisited A lot of water has passed under the bridge since this talk was made in 1998, and what has happened by 2006 is that we now see much more of the conduct I criticized. In particular, frictional costs for stock market investors have increased markedly, and there has been an increase in the share of young brain power becoming, with respect to investments, what the tout is with respect to horse racing tracks. Indeed, I recently heard Warren Buffett say that if present investment trends spread to race tracks, most bettors will try to improve results by always bringing along a well paid personal tout. However, at the same time that lovers of frictional costs have been spending more on what they love, there has also been an increase in holdings of stocks that track market indexes in a manner imposing negligible costs. This cost-averse, index-mimicking group does not grow fast enough to prevent an increase in total frictional costs, but more stock holding is slowly being converted to the passive indexed mode. Talk 7 Breakfast Meeting of the Philanthropy Roundtable November 10, 2000, Philanthropy Roundtable, Pasadena, California This speech was delivered in November 2000 to the Philanthropy Roundtable in Pasadena. Startling Charlie's family and friends, Jody Curtis of Foundation News and Commentary, characterized Charlie as a friendly old uncle, one with a jolly sense of humor at that. Charlie's goal, as was the case in the previous speech, was to save foundations from their own mistakes by getting them to invest effectively with minimum waste. Charlie warns foundations that they often act unwisely because of a failure to understand their own investment operations related to the larger system of which they're a part. Never one to pull punches, he boldly and bluntly challenges his listeners to cure the ignorance that is jeopardizing their foundations and those who depend on them. Charlie coins the term fabezzlement, the functional equivalent of embezzlement, to explain how wealth is stripped away by layers of unnecessary investment managers and consultants. I am here today to talk about so-called wealth effects from rising prices for U.S. common stocks. I should concede at the outset that wealth effects are part of the academic discipline of economics and that I have never taken a single course in economics nor tried to make a single dollar ever from foreseeing macroeconomic changes. Nonetheless, I have concluded that most Ph.D. economists underappraise the power of the common stock-based wealth effect under current extreme conditions. Everyone now agrees on two things. First, spending proclivity is influenced in an upward direction when stock prices go up and in a downward direction when stock prices go down. Second, the proclivity to spend is terribly important in macroeconomics. However, the professionals disagree about the size and timing of wealth effects and how they interact with other effects, including the obvious complication that increased spending tends to drive up stock prices while stock prices are concurrently driving up spending. 
Also, of course, rising stock prices increase corporate earnings even when spending is static, for instance, by reducing pension cost accruals, after which stock prices tend to rise more. Thus, wealth effects involve mathematical puzzles that are not nearly so well worked out as physics theories, and never can be. The wealth effect from rising U.S. stock prices is particularly interesting right now for two reasons. First, there has never been an advance so extreme in the price of widespread stock holdings, and with stock prices going up so much faster than GNP, the related wealth effect must now be bigger than was common before. Second, what has happened in Japan over roughly the last ten years has shaken up academic economics, as it obviously should, creating strong worries about recession from wealth effects in reverse. In Japan, with much financial corruption, there was an extreme rise in stock and real estate prices for a very long time, accompanied by extreme real economic growth compared to the United States. Then asset values crashed, and the Japanese economy stalled out at a very suboptimal level. After this, Japan, a modern economy that had learned all the would-be corrective Keynesian and monetary tricks, pushed these tricks hard and long. Japan, for many years, not only ran an immense government deficit, but also reduced interest rates to a place within hailing distance of zero and kept them there. Nonetheless, the Japanese economy year after year stays stalled, as Japanese proclivity to spend stubbornly resists all the tricks of the economists, and Japanese stock prices stay down. This Japanese experience is a disturbing example for everyone, and if something like it happened here, it would leave shrunken charitable foundations feeling clobbered by fate. Let us hope, as is probably the case, that the sad situation in Japan is caused in some large part by social psychological effects and corruption peculiar to Japan. In such case, our country may be at least half as safe as is widely assumed. Well, grant that spending proclivity as influenced by stock prices is now an important subject, and that the long Japanese recession is disturbing. How big are the economic influences of U.S. stock prices? A median conclusion of the economics professionals, based mostly on data collected by the Federal Reserve System, would probably be that the wealth effect on spending from stock prices is not all that big. After all, even now, real household net worth, excluding pensions, is probably up by less than 100% over the last 10 years, and remains a pretty modest figure per household, while market value of common stock is probably not yet one-third of aggregate household net worth, excluding pensions. Moreover, such household wealth in common stocks is almost incredibly concentrated, and the super-rich don't consume in proportion to their wealth. Leaving out pensions, the top 1% of households probably hold about 50% of common stock value, and the bottom 80% probably hold about 4%. Based on such data, plus unexciting past correlation between stock prices and spending, it is easy for a professional economist to conclude, say, that even if the average household spends incrementally at a rate of 3% of asset values in stock, consumer spending would have risen less than 0.5% per year over the last 10 years, as a consequence of the huge, unprecedented, long-lasting, consistent boom in stock prices. I believe that such economic thinking widely misses underlying reality right now. To me, such thinking looks at the wrong numbers and asks the wrong questions. Let me, the ultimate amateur, boldly try to do a little better, or at least a little differently. For one thing, I have been told, probably correctly, that Federal Reserve data collection, due to practical obstacles, doesn't properly take into account pension effects, including effects from 401k and similar plans. Assume some 63-year-old dentist has $1 million in GE stock in a private pension plan. 
the stock goes up in value to two million dollars, and the dentist, feeling flush, trades in his very old Chevrolet and leases a new Cadillac at the giveaway rate now common. To me, this is an obvious large wealth effect in the dentist's spending. To many economists, using Federal Reserve data, I suspect the occasion looks like profligate dissavings by the dentist. To me, the dentist, and many others like him, seems to be spending a lot more because of a very strong pension-related wealth effect. Accordingly, I believe that the present-day wealth effect from pension plans is far from trivial and much larger than it was in the past. For another thing, the traditional thinking of economists often does not take into account implications from the idea of bezel. Let me repeat, bezel, B-E-Z-Z-L-E. The word bezel is a contraction of the word embezzle, and it was coined by Harvard economics professor John Kenneth Galbraith to stand for the increase in any period of undisclosed embezzlement. Galbraith coined the bezel word because he saw that undisclosed embezzlement per dollar has a very powerful stimulating effect on spending. After all, the embezzler spends more because he has more income, and his employer spends as before because he doesn't know any of his assets are gone. But Galbraith did not push his insight on. He was content to stop with being a stimulating gadfly so I will now try to push Galbraith's bezel concept to the next logical level. As Keynes showed, in a native economy relying on earned income, when the seamstress sells a coat to the shoemaker for $20, the shoemaker has $20 less to spend and the seamstress has $20 more to spend. There is no Lollapalooza effect on aggregate spending. But when the government prints another $20 bill and uses it to buy a pair of shoes, the shoemaker has another $20 and no one feels poorer. And when the shoemaker next buys a coat, the process goes on and on, not to an infinite increase, but with what is now called the Keynesian multiplier effect, a sort of Lollapalooza effect on spending. Similarly, an undisclosed embezzlement has stronger stimulative effects per dollar on spending than a same-sized honest exchange of goods. Galbraith, being Scottish, liked the bleakness of life demonstrated by his insight. After all, the Scottish enthusiastically accepted the idea of preordained, unfixable infant damnation. But the rest of us don't like Galbraith's insight. Nevertheless, we have to recognize that Galbraith was roughly right. No doubt Galbraith saw the Keynesian multiplier-type economic effects promised by increases in bezel, but he stopped there. After all, bezel could not grow very big because the discovery of massive theft was nearly inevitable and sure to have reverse effects in due course. Thus the increase in private bezel could not drive economies up and up and on and on, at least for a considerable time, like government spending. Deterred by the apparent smallness of economic effects from his insight, Galbraith did not ask the next logical question. Are there important functional equivalents of bezel that are large and not promptly self-destructive? My answer to this question is yes. I will next describe only one. I will join Galbraith in coining new words. First, fabezel, to stand for the functional equivalent of bezel. Second, fabezelment, to describe the process of creating fabezel. And third, fabezlers, to describe persons engaged in fabezelment. Then I will identify an important source of fabezel right in this room. You people, I think, have created a lot of fabezel through your foolish investment management practices in dealing with your large holdings of common stock. If a foundation or other investor wastes 3% of assets per year in unnecessary, non-productive investment costs in managing a strongly rising stock portfolio, it still feels richer despite the waste, while the people getting the wasted 3%, for bezlers though they are, 
think they are virtuously earning income. The situation is functioning like undisclosed embezzlement without being self-limited. Indeed, the process can expand for a long while by feeding on itself. And all the while, what looks like spending from the earned income of the receivers of the wasted 3% is, in substance, spending from a disguised wealth effect from rising stock prices. This room contains many people pretty well stricken by expired years, in my generation or the one following. We tend to believe in thrift and avoiding waste as good things, a process that has worked well for us. It is paradoxical and disturbing to us that economists have long praised foolish spending as a necessary ingredient of a successful economy. Let us call foolish expenditures foolictures. And now, you holders of old values are hearing one of your own add to the case for foolictures, the case for fabezzlements, the functional equivalent of embezzlements. This may not seem like a nice way to start a new day. Please be assured that I don't like fabezzlements. It is just that I think fabezzlements are widespread and have powerful economic effects. And I also think that one should recognize reality even when one doesn't like it, indeed especially when one doesn't like it. Also, I think one should cheerfully endure paradox that one can't remove by good thinking. Even in pure mathematics they can't remove all paradoxes, and the rest of us should also recognize we are going to have to endure a lot of paradox, like it or not. Let me also take this occasion to state that my previous notion of 3% of assets per annum in waste in much of institutional investment management related to stocks is quite likely too low in a great many cases. A friend, after my talk to Foundation financial officers, sent me a summary of a study about mutual fund investors. The study concluded that the typical mutual fund investor gained at 7.25% per year in a 15-year period, when the average stock fund gained at 12.8% per year, presumably after expenses. Thus, the real performance lag for investors was over 5% of assets per year, in addition to whatever percentage per year the mutual funds, after expenses, lagged behind stock market averages. If this mutual fund study is roughly right, it raises huge questions about foundation wisdom in changing investment managers all the time, as mutual fund investors do. If the extra lag reported in the mutual fund study exists, it is probably caused in considerable measure by folly and the constant removal of assets from lagging portfolio managers being forced to liquidate stock holdings, followed by the placement of removed assets with new investment managers that have high-pressure, asset-gaining hoses in their mouths, and clients whose investment results will not be improved by the super-rapid injection of new funds. I am always having trouble like that caused by this new mutual fund study. I describe something realistically that looks so awful that my description is disregarded as extreme satire instead of reality. Next, new reality tops the horror of my disbelieved description by some large amount. No wonder monger notions of reality are not widely welcome. This may be my last talk to charitable foundations. Now, toss in with fabezzlement in investment management about $750 billion in floating, ever-growing, ever-renewing wealth from employee stock options, and you get a lot more common stock-related wealth effect driving consumption, with some of the wealth effect from employee stock options being, in substance, fabezzle effect, facilitated by the corrupt accounting practice now required by standard practice. Next, consider that each 100-point advance in the S&P adds about $1 trillion in stock market value and throw in some sort of Keynesian-type multiplier effect related to all fabezzlement. The related macroeconomic wealth effects, I believe, become much larger than is conventionally supposed.
and aggregate wealth effect from stock prices can get very large indeed. It is an unfortunate fact that great and foolish excess can come into prices of common stocks in the aggregate. They are valued partly like bonds, based on roughly rational projections of use value in producing future cash, but they are also valued partly like Rembrandt paintings, purchased mostly because their prices have gone up so far. This situation, combined with big wealth effects at first up and later down, can conceivably produce much mischief. Let us try to investigate this by a thought experiment. One of the big British pension funds once bought a lot of ancient art, planning to sell it ten years later, which it did at a modest profit. Suppose all pension funds purchased ancient art and only ancient art with all their assets. Wouldn't we eventually have a terrible mess on our hands with great and undesirable macroeconomic consequences? And wouldn't the mess be bad if only half of all pension funds were invested in ancient art? And if half of all stock value became a consequence of mania, isn't the situation much like the case wherein half of pension assets are ancient art? My foregoing acceptance of the possibility that stock value in aggregate can become irrationally high is contrary to the hard-form efficient market theory that many of you once learned as gospel from your mistaken professors of yore. Your mistaken professors were too much influenced by rational man models of human behavior from economics and too little by foolish man models from psychology and real-world experience. Crowd folly, the tendency of humans under some circumstances to resemble lemmings, explains much foolish thinking of brilliant men and much foolish behavior, like the investment management practices of many foundations represented here today. It is sad that today each institutional investor apparently fears most of all that its investment practices will be different from the practices of the rest of the crowd. Well, this is enough uncredentialed musing for one breakfast meeting. If I am at all right, our present prosperity has had a stronger boost from common stock price-related wealth effects, some of them disgusting, than has been the case in many former booms. If so, what was greater on the upside in the recent boom could also be greater on the downside at some time of future stock price decline. Incidentally, the economists may well conclude eventually that when stock market advances and declines are regarded as long-lasting, there is more downside force on optional consumption per dollar of stock market decline than there is upside force per dollar of stock market rise. I suspect that economists would believe this already if they were more willing to take assistance from the best ideas outside their own discipline or even to look harder at Japan. Remembering Japan, I also want to raise the possibility that there are, in the very long term, virtue effects in economics. For instance, that widespread corrupt accounting will eventually create bad long-term consequences as a sort of obverse effect from the virtue-based boost double-entry bookkeeping gave to the heyday of Venice. I suggest that when the financial scene starts reminding you of Sodom and Gomorrah, you should fear practical consequences even if you like to participate in what is going on. Finally, I believe that the implications for charitable foundations of my conclusions today, combined with the conclusions in my former talk to foundation financial officers, go way beyond implications for investment techniques. If I am right, almost all U.S. foundations are unwise through failure to understand their own investment operations related to the larger system. If so, this is not good. A rough rule in life is that an organization foolish in one way in dealing with a complex system is all too likely to be foolish in another. So the wisdom of foundation donations may need as much improvement as investment practices of foundations. And here we have two more old rules to guide us. One rule is ethical and the other is prudential. 
The ethical rule is from Samuel Johnson, who believed that maintenance of easily removable ignorance by a responsible office holder was treacherous malfeasance in meeting moral obligation. The prudential rule is that underlying the old Warner and Swayze advertisement for machine tools. The man who needs a new machine tool and hasn't bought it is already paying for it. The Warner and Swayze rule also applies, I believe, to thinking tools. If you don't have the right thinking tools, you and the people you seek to help are already suffering from your easily removable ignorance. Talk 7 Revisited This talk in November 2000 turned out to be pretty timely because stock market unpleasantness thereafter greatly increased particularly for high-tech stocks. But as nearly as I can tell, there has been absolutely no theoretical reaction from anyone who heard or read the talk. I still believe everything I said about significant macroeconomic effects from fabezzlement through excessive investment costs, but no one trained in economics has ever tried to engage with me on this subject. Undeterred by this apathy, I am now going to push my reasoning one notch further by laying out a thought experiment extrapolating the combined reasoning of talks six and seven to an assumed higher level of investment costs. Assume that 2006 stock prices rise by 200% while corporate earnings do not rise, at which point all the sensibly distributable earnings of all U.S. corporations combined amount to less than the total of all stockholder investment costs, because such costs rise proportionally with stock prices. Now, so long as this situation continues, no money at all, net of investment costs, is going out of all corporations to all corporate owners combined. Instead, frictional cost imposers get more than all sensibly distributable corporate earnings. And at the end of any year, the corporate owners in aggregate can get money by reason of their stock holding only by making stock sales to providers of new money, who, considering high continuing investment costs for themselves and others, must expect that stock prices will keep rising indefinitely while all stock owners combined are getting nothing net except by selling stock to more new money. To many imposers of frictional investment costs, this peculiar state of affairs would seem ideal, with more than 100% of sensibly distributable corporate earnings going to precisely the right sort of people, instead of being wasted on the shareholders, and some economists would regard the result as good because it came about in a market. But to me it would resemble a weird and disturbing combination of 1 a gambling casino imposing an unreasonably greedy take for the house, plus, two, a form of Ponzi-like scheme similar to the market for expensive art, in which participation would be unsuitable for pension funds, etc., plus, three, a bubble of speculation that would eventually burst, probably with unfortunate macroeconomic consequences. And what the situation would not look like is a state of affairs likely to function well in guiding the capital development of the surrounding civilization. Such a state of affairs, or even a lesser version, would, I think, reduce the reputation of our country, and deservedly so.